So what are you drinking, Bart? I am having a Cooper's Pale Ale. Marvellous. A classic choice. All right. I'm having a 8%. There's a there's a 5% version. Three Oak Cider. Can I try a sip? You may. Nice. It uh, tastes much like the 5%. You like the strong shit, right? I, I find it a bit too... Uh... You don't taste the alcohol in this one. Yeah, okay. That's pretty good. I don't drink all that often, but as I've said on this podcast before, if I'm drinking... For the purposes of I'd like a buzz, I don't want to fuck around, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, fair I just, enough. I just want to get there. And as a large lad, like, I occasionally need to drink a bunch in order to get there. <laughs> <laughs> I like a spirit, but I don't keep it in my house because I don't want to hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> we have a cupboard full of very nice gins that are my gins. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, I'm not going to just suck down Tessa's gin because one I'm a Nosmic I can't appreciate yeah and two that'd be across the line for me like I am drinking for a buzz but I'm not at the point where I'm just downing spirits to get to get drunk you know there's a reason like if I buy a case of these things <laughs> and now that we've talked about our self-medication processes hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant visual aids with an audio track about statistics in everyday life I'm Tess my pronouns are she they and I'm here in an exam committee meeting reviewing the marks for podcasting that my hosts have got this year. Unfortunately, the marks have not been great, so we're going to have to have some changes to the program next year. Oh, my heart rate's increasing. <laughs> the trauma. Oh. <laughs> Drowning their sorrows in the local uni bar, it's Dean and Bart. How are you two going? Fuck me. I mean, like, I'd be here regardless of my marks, so I don't think that's uh, <laughs> particularly like... Uh... When I had a bad exam at university, even though at Wollongong University... Uh, shout out to anyone who's there or has been there. If you exit the main exam room or the exam room where it typically takes place and turn left, you will be at the uni bar within about 100 metres. It's 10 metres from the front door. All right. Well, yep. in that case, so you can be drowning your sorrows quite quickly. I, however, turned right, took a very sad bus ride home and would eat jam. <laughs> Not as a coping mechanism, but because at that point in my life, that was the only food in my house. <laughs> <laughs> These days, like, it's coming back to the jam being the only food in my house. It's really grim. Oh, no. <laughs> Listener, if you would like to rescue Bart from the jam f with a knife from a jar lifestyle, please sign up to our Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com <laughs> slash statistically insignificant. Talking about examination, today we're actually talking about marking as a statistical instrument for quantifying competence and knowledge. This is particularly relevant to me because not only am I a statistician, I am running the final exam for my stats students this week. So I have a lot of marking that's about to land on my desk. And you're also heavily traumatized by exams. Oh, so much. Like, there's a reason I don't do coursework anymore, and it's mostly anxiety related to assessments. Ah, uh, such fond memories of Tess just staring at her coursework, trying to study, tears streaming down her face. Yeah, at that point, Dean decided to employ my mum to uh, point out that actually I could defer exams on mental health grounds, which let that be news to any of you who are doing mental health breakdowns during your exam periods. That's grounds to defer exams. You can do it. It's legal. I love how I sort of didn't know. Well, I did know, but I just sort of didn't know during university that you should write to a rubric. I knew it. I just refused to do it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a distinct problem. In arts, I didn't really write to a rubric very often, but I had an idea of what I should put in and how to structure it, which ba it turns out was what the rubric actually went through. In maths, rubrics don't exist, which is both good and bad, <laughs> Good in the sense that, frankly, writing rubrics for maths is basically impossible a lot of the time. I write marking guides instead, which basically say what the right answer is and how many points should be awarded up to the correct answer. I try to give my students as many marks as possible. Some of them make it very difficult. Yeah. In, in this topic, talking particularly about like an ongoing conversations I have with people about qualifications and certifications and things. Sometimes it is actually important to check that people know or can do stuff before you give them a piece of paper stating as such. I feel that this is more important in some places than others, and a lot of what it comes down to, particularly in like qualifications around fields where you wind up being responsible for the welfare of others, is it's kind of to filter out the worst possible cases. It doesn't necessarily act as a great filter for actual competence in practice. The hope is that the workplace will do some of that. Often it does not, and that sucks. Right. Before they give you the huge, like, brain scraping stick, Yeah. they want to make sure you can scrape a brain. 
Yes. So in, in this context, I think that assessment is more important and rigor of assessment is more important in some spaces than others. Uh, I don't think that assessment is the be-all and end-all of learning. In fact, I think it sucks if people treat it that way. But it exists, and the manner in which we assess things varies radically across the different things that we are trying to do. All of them are effectively a method of quantification. You're trying to measure something, the competence and knowledge of the person being examined, which is why I started looking at this stuff as a statistical tool. Don't they know you could just measure the skull? <laughs> <laughs> why don't they just do that? That's way easier. The marking schemes used for this sort of gatekeeping process, they vary wildly in their character and their consistency. So we're going to talk about the basic statistical structure of different ways of doing marking. Then we'll talk about overall problems with the ways that assumptions work around marking, ideas about validity and consistency, and objectiveness. Are we talking about sort of comparing the results of one student to another in a statistical manner, or is the act of marking a single exam paper itself a statistically significant act? I know you're using the f term significant deliberately to get a rise out of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would say it is a... your eyebrows rose. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it is a statistical act. Okay. Yeah. It's the name of the podcast. You need to advertise more. This is why Patreon numbers suck. <laughs> <laughs> we need a name drop of the podcast at least once every 150 seconds. Jesus you, Christ. I'm you say thought. that, but... Uh, Statistically insignificant. They're already listening to the podcast. Uh, they might be trapped inside an elevator where it's playing. They could be given a lift by somebody who's listening to it in the car, and they might be like, what's this nerd shit they're listening to? Statistically insignificant. And so... <laughs> See, if, you know, we just need to get them to sign up to the Patreon, and it's it spreads like a virus. You spent too long in marketing, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first structure we're going to deal with is kind of the most fundamental. It's the qualitative test. Did you know that old newspapers and magazines used to think that um, one of their major points of, like, advertisement was people leaving them behind on train seats and whatnot? Like, they, they, they believe that a, a key avenue for their marketing was, like, abandoned copies. And so that's why a lot of the um, the games and puzzles and whatnot in them were so easy back in the day, mm. all removable on a single page, so you could take it and leave behind the rest of the paper. That kind of makes sense to me, though, because, like, I don't know, I've picked up a newspaper that's been on an abandoned train seat, and maybe I've been influenced by the advertising within. So I suspect it works in a similar way to pirating music actually works to help smaller ones. Yeah, I don't I, think, I, I don't think there's sheet, a significant but... influence on the readership of a, of a newspaper is leaving things behind. I'm just saying that it was considered, it was orthodoxy that this was a major part of their circulation. <laughs> and so it influenced the content they produced. <laughs> Qualitative assessment is pass-fail. So this is considered qualitative instead of quantitative because you have kind of this binary outcome. Does this include like over a certain percentage is a pass, below a certain percentage is a fail? So I would call that an adaptation of a percentile measurement. Right, whereas a, a true qualitative assessment is literally just pass or fail. Yeah, can you do this or not? Right, okay. Do or do not, there is no try. There is sometimes try, how about? I don't see try up there. The try is a question of what does it take to pass. Oh my god. Yeah, it's more, it's more complex than this. I'm so sorry. I'm just saying you're such a nerd. I've got the perfect opportunity for a Yoda <laughs> reference. You're like, well, actually, there is a little bit of try. Pass, fail. Do or do not. I don't respect Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, no one does. <laughs> I went to, I did a TAFE course in screenwriting and it was kind of like a pass, fail system, but almost everyone passed if you put the essays in and stuff. And like, yeah, it wasn't like particularly difficult or whatever to pass yeah so this is used for a lot of technical skills if you are doing welding or some sort of even even in medicine it shows up a lot can you take a blood sample and things like that yeah these technical skills are quite amenable to this kind of assessment because it's very much a case of well can you do the thing yeah the problem with that can you levitate a starfighter out of a bog for example i'm being given the shut the fuck up look. <laughs> <laughs> So aside from things like technical skills, PhDs are a pass-fail system. You do get the opportunity to make revisions to a PhD, but generally, at the end of the day, you either get the PhD or you don't, based on a pass-fail threshold. This kind of reflects interesting structure in this system. The first is the strength of it. Save on ink. You just have to write pass or fail. Yeah, but particularly, it's very robust. 
there's all kinds of different things in all kinds of different scenarios that can be pass fail and don't necessarily require something that you can assign a number to or measure in any other kind of way. This is particularly true for PhDs because frankly no PhDs are really the same and to compare them sometimes you can say that one PhD is better than another but on the whole it's mostly a matter of yeah, we, the the people who already have PhDs, think this is pretty good work, good enough to award you with this degree, or we don't. And that's about it, really. They're just such incredibly different creatures, even within the same discipline most of the time. Isn't the problem with that that, like, PhDs at this point in history have just become, like if you can get the right connections and the right supervisors, you will pass. And if you get the wrong ones, you will fail. Like It really depends on what you're doing and where you are. Some PhDs and some particular fields are a lot more robust than others. Well, even within maths, I know some places where it is a lot of, do you have the right supervisor to get a pass, whether or not you do any reasonable work. Other places it has a, is a lot more rigorous than that. And one of the reasons that people look at where the degree has been awarded, as well as what the degree is, is because some universities are known to be better assessors than others of their PhD students right. and of their undergrads. And another part of this is that back in the day, PhDs required sweet fuck all. It was, you would sit down for a few years and amble your way through some literature and have a think about things and then write your treatise and then it'll go, yep. That's a PhD, I guess. Like, you, you look back at the PhDs at, like, the turn of the, the 20th century and way less robust than anything you're likely to see now. Some of that is because there's a huge body of scientific literature that you have to look at now that you would not have existed at the time, and some of that is just the standards change. And also, I guess, most of the low-hanging fruit has been done. Sure. Like, legitimately, particularly in maths, it's very hard to find a simple enough problem for somebody to do easily. One of the weaknesses is that the, the threshold for replicability is difficult. So what is the threshold to pass? Replicability? Like... To, to do a, a task repeatedly. Okay, so like, how do we make sure that the standards for student A match the standards for student B? Yeah, so how many times... How many times can do we have to see that you can do this correctly in yeah. order to... I suppose with something like a PhD, that's the sheer length of the document. You have to maintain a level of quality throughout. So with a PhD, this would be something like your lab work is robust if you're doing something experimental. In practice, if you are applying for qualifications as like, as like a nurse or something, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can consistently do something like take blood or perform a blood pressure assessment. I remember when I went in for my appendectomy, they had a nurse there who was sticking on the diode things for me. And the nurse watching her is like, so do you like, um, know what you're doing? And she's like, uh, she's like, you didn't feel for any of the points. You just stuck them on. Was that a trainee? She was, yeah. Okay, yeah. She was getting chewed out. She's like, it's not your fault. The supervising nurse was quite kind. She's like, it's not your fault. Somebody should have taught you better. Yes. But yeah. uh, I then had uh, a, a free little impromptu waxing <laughs> before this woman <laughs> dug up to the knuckle in my various fleshy parts to find the bits to stick the diodes on. And then the trainee's like, oh, that's good. Uh, and then proceeded to stick the last, she said, you do the last one. Stuck it on without feeling around. At that point, the, tra the trainer's like, maybe it wasn't the person who fucking taught you. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I, uh, when I was a teen, I um, put a piece of bark through my foot. Like I jumped Ooh. down a small ledge onto nice work. Uh, one of those bark gardens, you know. Oh yeah, they're little daggers, those shits. Yeah, yeah. And like, it just like went through like, part of my foot i think it was a proper doctor trying to get like local anesthesia into my foot it was much more <laughs> painful than like the actual thing because yes. it kept blowing out of the wound oh no <laughs> so he wasn't putting it in the right valve yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> nice nice in this is also not just how many times do you have to do it correctly but do you have to do it correctly every time so is there a percentage success rate? Is there a limit on the attempts? You have three guesses. Well, yeah, I mean, if the threshold to pass something is demonstrate you can do this 100 times, can you take 200 tries at it? Can you take 500 tries at it? These are things that have to be asked when you are trying to develop these kind of assessment tools and these kind of qualifications. Sometimes the questions are not 
entirely straightforward. Whereas the percent success rate is much easier to test on something where you have multiple questions. What do you mean? Well, like if I ask you to do four variations on the same basic principle Hmm. to see like how many of them you you grasp. Yeah, so you can think of like percentage success rate is do I get a good reading using this instrument 80% of the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what a good reading is, usually you would have some sort of standard thing that you're testing it against. So of course, as soon as you introduce like a percentage success rate, this is a measurable quantity. We need a sound effect for like when we spot the measurable quantity in any given topic. Ba ba da ba <laughs> ba ba da ba. Okay, something, but yeah, we should get our own little air horns and whatnot. Listen, I am not giving you a soundboard. I wouldn't be able to press it. I sit here next to you. Yes, that's part of why I'm not giving you a I soundboard. Could, I have to reach across no. and press on the... Ch- I'm not even going to do it and she slap my hand. No. I c- there's nothing to do! How can you say no? I am very minimalist in my uh, podcasting, so imagine if I had a soundboard, like, once every... 13 episodes, we'd get like one Yeah, the sound problem effect. is Dean would use it a lot. Wait, there's a soundboard built into Discord. Can I press it before Tess needs my soundboard permissions? Uh, you're muted, so probably not. Uh, the soundboard is muted separately. She's immediately reaching to try and stop me. I have, I have already got your soundboard muted. Ah, oh, please, it has to be you! I can't even find the mobile, the mobile permissions for it, so... Excellent. I have now muted Bart's soundboard as well. Yours is the only one, so... (laughs) I muted Dean's soundboard when he and his brother in a tabletop game we were playing were just using it incessantly. It's funny. It's funny to make stupid sounds. I mean, that's true, but at the same time, you it loses its funny after a certain amount of time, I would say. No, no, no. no, no, no. This, you is, see, a, Dean this is, is a linear scaling funny, <laughs> and it only goes one direction. No, Dean is of the opinion that if something loses its funny because it's been repeated too often, then there is some further point of view which becomes funny again. Yeah, that, that's, that's and, a, that is not like a strange opinion of mine. That isn't an observed form of comedy. That is sometimes true, but with soundboard humor... Mm. No. Mm-hmm. And also, Dean is not only sure that it is true for everything, he is determined to find that point for everything <laughs> as well. It is it is true for everything. The point can be found. <laughs> I assure you, it, it in goes finite around time, funny again, and it's even better for having waited. In finite time. Statistically insignificant. <laughs> like, she, she laughed! She laughed! Fucking hell, I'm so good. She's going to cut that out so I don't seem clever. Yep. None of us are so good. (laughs) Anyway, continue. (laughs) So in many respects, awarding a degree is a kind of qualitative assessment. You either satisfy the requirements of a degree or you don't. This applies to undergraduate degrees just as much as it applies to PhD. The components of passing in an undergraduate degree are coursework. Usually you need to have passed some number of subjects in order to pass your degree program. So that kind of percentage success rate of the number of subjects or a count of the number of past subjects is a slightly different form of measurement that goes into this. Later in the episode we'll come back to how these different things get combined. Next we are adding a hint of structure which is to talk about an ordinal scale. So these are categories with an ordering, so one thing is a stronger result than another. Now technically, pass-fail is two categories, and they have an ordering in that a pass is a better result than a fail, but we don't really necessarily treat it like that. Your most common is something like A, B, C, D, E, F. What does ordinal mean in this ordered yeah okay right has an order yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. so we have an idea that an a is better than a c is better than an f so this is an ordering on these categories the differences between these we don't necessarily think are consistent so this is ordered it's not measurable in the sense that the difference between an e and the f may not be the same as the difference between an a and a b In Australian universities, the more common equivalent is called a distinction scale. So you get a high distinction, distinction, credit, pass, fail. Similar idea to the A, B, C, D, E, F sort of thing. In some situations, you will also get like finer gradations, like you'll have A+, plus, which means particularly high A, for example, B- or something. So you get a kind of finer grained scale 
than just the six letters, but it's the same basic principle that you have these ordered categories that indicate quality. And also the distinction to scale usually has like a hundred point system as well attached to it, right? Like Yeah, yeah. So it depends on the subject. Most subjects will have a percentage underlying it, yeah. but how you get a percentage out of coursework at universities is complex. And in fact, I would say that one of the strengths of this is that you don't have to use a percentage because frankly, percentages are kind of a fiction. Sure. A 50% doesn't mean you know half the subject. Realistically, for all, some people might claim that that's what they aim to do. It can't represent that. I'd get 60s that were based on what information I could glean from the exam about the subject I hadn't paid any attention to. Yeah. So I'm just saying, HDs are too easy to get. Typically, for the for the listener, if you don't know. I don't agree. 60s is a credit. Yeah, no, 60s <laughs> is a pass. I know, I was about to say, HD is 85% plus. So this is something I found that was quite interesting to move from like an arts degree to a maths degree. So in an arts, I would say it is easier to pass than it is in maths. But getting a high distinction in arts is legitimately harder in many respects, depending on particular subject, than it is in something like maths. Because in undergraduate maths, you're not expected to have an original idea. In undergraduate arts, particularly in the like senior subjects, to get HDs, you kind of need to have original ideas. Yeah. And that's hard. Legitimately, that is difficult. Or at least an idea that's not in the course material, let's put it that way. Or the teacher likes you. That's the other way to get a HD. <laughs> that's how you got them, right? Yeah, you could... I'm, I'm not going into this, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Having an original idea is very difficult yes and like you also have to argue it well yeah the, like part of that yes you need to substantiate it yeah fun fact if you have literally any level of material analysis like any kind of leftist theory you just a, just smash a, undergrad just apply that to any undergraduate arts assignment and a because they're all marxists or at least they're all <laughs> familiar with themselves they'll like it and b they don't see that from any of their other students yeah yeah, just 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 print yourself distinctions. I had an a international relations teacher who said, uh, if you do world systems theory in the essay, I'm probably just gonna laugh at you. That guy was an asshole. Oh so, sure, yeah. but like I think yeah. Yeah, it does happen, not... <laughs> right? Look, I'm gonna be honest. I feel like your first error was doing international relations. I thought it would be interesting, but whatever, who cares? I just wanted to know about yeah, how countries right. interact. I, I think that's like a, a valid thing to yeah. like care about. Like, Yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely curious as to whether international relations actually told you any of that. To an extent, like I think the realist theories, while quite right wing, are kind of handy in like assessing things because they like... Uh, They're very mask off and honest. Yeah, and they talk about power relations and that kind of thing. And like, Yeah, well, liberalism certainly doesn't want to do that. No, certainly. So one apocryphal tale that I have, uh, this is second hand, but a guy I know in maths once had a subject... So this is like graduate level maths. And at this level... It is very, very difficult to do marking. The content is hard, the, the assessments are hard, all this sort of thing. It's and more of an argument as a proof sort of thing than it is anything like a calculation. He had one particular student who wasn't him in the class keep pestering the or pressuring the, the lecturer to basically give them a rubric or a marking scheme or something because it was like you got a percentage. And at one point, the lecturer just said, look, at the end of the subject, those that deserve a high distinction will get a high distinction. <laughs> those that deserve a pass will get a pass. And in many respects, the further you go, the more like that it becomes. Because going any further with percentile or finer grain sort of stuff just kind of loses meaning. Yeah, at some point, the, the meaningful pursuit of a particular discipline can't be broken down into a series of checkboxes. And can't be broken down into a series of percentages either. Unfortunately, while the strength of this is not attempting precision or numerical measurement, an unfortunate weakness is that it can be kind of vibes-based. Because Which is fine unless your vibes are fucked. Yeah, right? So if you have an assessor who is not good at their job, and look, it does happen. I have had some particularly annoying lecturers then there is legitimate difficulty in getting them to properly mark things, even on a scale like this. The threshold between the different threshold sorry, the threshold between the different marks here is very rarely well defined. If you are going from a percentage scale to this, then you usually have like cutoffs. But even then, 
the percentages are rarely particularly well defined and often what you get in practice is that if somebody's close to a borderline that would put them up a grade you put them up a grade so i have never awarded somebody an 84 and given them a distinction instead of an 85 and given them a high distinction because frankly that one percent difference that's a measurement error in, in your assessment instruments so chances are they are actually a high distinction student and your measurement instruments didn't actually get access to that. Okay, but if someone got an 86, would you bump them down to an 85? Absolutely not. Okay, but there's a problem there. There is a bit of a bias there, yes. But this is one of the problems. If you have somebody who is going through and looking in detail at the marks of a student, and they say an 85, which is a high distinction, knowing that this is common practice, they will go, okay, that's a borderline high distinction. They may have been bumped up. But that's okay. Chances are this is not going to be their only high distinction. Right. Right. And if somebody was legitimately getting 84s, 84s across the board. Something very suspicious about yeah, that. Yeah. Right. E exactly. It's or, too or, consistent. Or they might legitimately be at that level. And again, as you say, measurement error. So it kind of all washes out. Yeah. 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 And I am generally inclined to give students the benefit of the doubt when it comes to bumping up marks rather than reducing them. Because... I have never met a student who doesn't have something going on in their life that makes it hard to study. This is particularly true with however many high percentage of students these days have to work one or multiple jobs at the same time as they are doing university, which makes it really, really shit. Yeah, yeah. How is statistics marked in regard to that? Like, what is the difference between an 84 and an 86 or whatever? Like, uh, This is where you get into the problem that it's actually really hard to construct a marking scheme, a percentage marking scheme, which is what you're talking about, that actually corresponds to some idea of percentage knowledge of a subject. We'll get to that in just a second, because boy, do I have some opinions on it. <laughs> I once got an 84 in creative writing. <laughs> I, I have, I have, I think, one or two 84s from my arts degree. I am still salty about them. Oh, uh, yeah. no, 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 I've got one too. Just one, but it yeah. was, they uh, yeah, yeah. bumped up my mark from an 80 two i think because it was supposed to be a debate but the person i was debating didn't submit their thing in time or whatever so they they right. put on the so thing you, so you you got to do the empty chair yeah yeah but like they put on my thing oh that's like, incredible oh you didn't rebut the other person oh but what was to rebut and then they bumped it up to just b below the high distinction See, that's fucking rude right <laughs> oh my god anyway part of the weaknesses of this is that it can be based on bad numerical scales Shitty rubrics. Mm -hmm. I know I, in the context of this podcast, I often play the fool, but occasionally I do have some moments of intellectual incisiveness. You should let me know when they happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to be able to write actually a pretty mean essay, and I fucking hated marking rubrics because oftentimes they'd ask you to hit points that were just inferior to the kind of things you could come up with if you actually read the text. Yes. So I find them yeah, extremely yeah. So, annoying. So marking rubrics are typically either so vague they are useless of so prescriptive they are bad yeah hitting that sweet spot in the middle where they can inform a student in what they should do but not introduce pathologies very very difficult i've never seen one frankly that did I had an argument with my teacher because one of the rubric items was address this particular point in the work and i said i don't believe that point is valid so i'm not going to be addressing it and then i had a big argument with them about just address it I'm like it's you're you're begging the question the <laughs> literally yes so did you win the argument no, they were the teacher. <laughs> you can't win that kind of, sort of argument without uh, committing a felony. <laughs> I mean, I've had students argue for more marks. I wasn't arguing for more marks. I was arguing that he changed the rubric. Ah, okay. Anyway, whatever. So another potential weakness is that you get population-based constraints. What that means is at some universities, you get told you cannot award more than this percentage of your class the top mark. So, Ooh, grading on a curve. Yeah, but in a very, very kind of punitive fashion that really sucks for students in particular. Because if you say, okay, you can't award, award more than five high distinctions, it is not necessarily easy or even possible to differentiate between the fifth and the sixth person in that sort of ordering. Submitted work for a given assessment is what we call a partially ordered set. You can have some stuff that is clearly better or worse, but you can have some stuff where it's like, actually, these are probably comparable. How am I going to differentiate them? And imposing percentage-based restrictions is, is just... I understand why it is done from a theoretical standpoint, because the idea is that 
it removes the pressure on the lecturer to award more higher marks than are potentially reasonable, and it means that your top percent is actually the top percent of the class. But populations are messier than the theoretical constraints we want to put on them, and your top percent mark may not actually represent any kind of reasonable performance in the student body, particularly not class to class. Also, what if you're a really good teacher and you manage to coach all your students to be at an incredible high quality? Yeah, yeah. It's really, really bad. Yeah. So in general... And what if you're awful and then you have to give a certain number of... <laughs> yes, that is also a concern. I mean, that's what the entire VCE is kind of based around, right? The VCE, which is like the... Victorian secondary education ranking system, right? Well, they might have, yeah, changed the name of it uh, since then, I'm not from Victoria, so yeah, I don't yeah. know. But, but um, like... across Australia, I think the ATAR, Australian Tertiary Acceptance Ranking? Yeah. Or Achievement Ranking or something like that. ATAR is the typical number given to students that is used to gatekeep their access to university programs. It is a ranking. It's a percentile ranking in the population. So if you get an 85 you are roughly the 85th percentile in academic achievement based on what you did at school. The statistical model that goes into it is complex to say the least, because not only does it account for the raw marks that you got in different subjects, it treats subjects differently. So subjects that are perceived to be more academically challenging are scored better than subjects that are considered not academically challenging. So some of these I think are pretty reasonable arguments to make, some of them aren't. So for example, if you have your different levels of maths, the harder math subjects are harder than the easier math subjects. A 50% in the hardest math subject corresponds to a higher mark in an easier math subject. Yeah. I think that's pretty justifiable, right? For sure. And famously, if you spoke a second language, you're encouraged to do that as a, as a higher education subject. Because if, you, if you're a native speaker, that's great. You'll do really well in it. And they, they were weighted pretty well because it's hard to learn a language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny, though, that shit is, like, weighted depending on, like, what everyone else in your class did in that particular subject. Yes. So they include what's called a cohort effect. So, uh, sorry, a class effect. Cohort effect is slightly different. But basically, um, in order to control for the fact that different classes have different education experiences, they will introduce kind of a moderating factor that accounts for variability between those. So if one class does really, really well, and another class doesn't do quite so well, that will probably get smoothed out by the class effect on the basis that one may have had a better teacher or not as much resources or whatever. There are environmental factors that you can kind of bring in there. What was the one before ATAR? Because I got one of those. UAI. Ready. UAI. Fun fact. In regards to high distinctions, my UAI, 84.5. I'm only saying I got an 87. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> uh, oh, I was just so mad. I'm like, I know they don't do HDs for yeah, yeah. the UAI <laughs> rankings, but it like, it stung. Was there something at 85 that you were looking forward to? or I think at that point I was looking forward to dying. I think I was just... <laughs> yeah, true, fair enough. <laughs> mostly, I think it's a hobby I would just suicidally ideate. So, mm, yeah, mm. I don't think I had any, any, any real intentions at the time. <laughs> I think uh, when I got my ATAR back, I, looked, I said, oh, I guess if I applied myself, I could have done better. Of course, the fact that I wasn't mentally capable of applying myself at the time is a different issue. I mean, I probably should, like, go to a psych that would be <laughs> yeah look i should probably have been going to a psychologist since my early teens but um <laughs> look the early 2000s were a very different world for that sort of thing sure <laughs> yeah along with the idea of the population-based constraints is the idea of grade inflation so this is more typically applied to this ordinal scale than it is applied to like percentage marks because this is seen as more flexible, the transference between them does happen. But the and idea the grade of... gets big and round. Exactly. So the idea with grade inflation is that there is pressure for students to be awarded better grades. That means that over time, the proportion of students who get the top grade is likely to increase, even if the quality of the students remains the same. I think that this is more reasonable to expect in some areas than others. I also think that it really depends on what you want your grading system to do, because if you are trying to use your top mark to pick out the best of your students, having 30% of your students get high distinctions is not helpful to that role. However, 
if you have a system which is demonstrating competence as opposed to excellence, then grade inflation doesn't necessarily apply so much. That's about lowering the standards of passing more than it is about inflating grades. Isn't grade inflation like kind of a right-wing talking point? Look, it wouldn't surprise me because basically what they... Are, I have not seen it too much because I don't tend to read that media. Fair. I can certainly imagine it as basically them shitting on the arts. Yeah. Because they think, oh, it's too easy to get high marks in sociology or whatever. There are issues in the US where something like 30 or 40% of marks awarded are A's, which is the top mark. Yeah. And that makes it very, very hard to differentiate. The term used is actually discriminate, but to differentiate between your excellent students and your good students. And sometimes that difference does matter if you're looking for prospective PhDs. Yeah, but look, there's a lot of perfectly reasonable systems that the right wing has embraced and ruined the image of, such as phrenology. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think we should be throwing the baby out with the bathwater or the, uh, the calipers out with the skull saw. <laughs> so the next one we're going to look at is a numerical scale. The other one wasn't numerical? Oh, that's right. It was, it was ordinal. Yeah. Just to be clear, we can represent these as numbers, right? Yeah. Like, you call this one, two, three, four, five, six, right? But the difference between a five and a six mm -hmm. is not the same as the difference between one and a two. Right, and because even they though are... we might peg them to a percentage scale, that doesn't necessarily... No, it doesn't necessarily transform to a fact that you can actually measure a difference or that the differences are the same. Gotcha. This is the distinction between an ordinal and a numerical scale, and... One of the most common mistakes that I see in people doing analysis with ordinal data is they treat it like numbers. This is particularly a bugbear of mine when it comes to Likert scales, so you're strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. That's an ordinal scale. I was just right? about to bring up Lik Likert scales because, like, doesn't this all kind of fit into that, right? Yeah, so the Likert scale is an ordinal scale. Yeah. It just gets treated as a numerical one when some dickhead in management decides to take your Likert scale results from surveys or whatever and apply numerical analysis to it. Yeah. Which is, I know I, I brought it up as a joke, but it, it's just modern day skull science. Yes. Yeah, yeah. W w are you an INTJ, Dean? I think I might be, actually. <laughs> I don't actually know what they mean, so I can't I say. don't know what it means. I'm not getting into this, but I had a psychologist who was trying to get me measured for my fucking... What, what is that called? Personality type? The specific scale that has the numbers on it. Five. Listen, and note, note that we respect it so little, we don't even remember it's fucking... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, didn't, didn't he argue that because big companies uses this in hiring, that means it must be valid? Yeah, I said, this is bullshit. And he said, is something that the, the Fortune 500 companies use invalid? And I, what you're I, saying? I no longer, yes. Yeah, I said yes. Yeah. <laughs> I no longer went to that psychologist. <laughs> yeah. So your numerical scale is typically something like zero to one hundred percent, or some sort of counted mark. Uh, what does counted mark mean? So, like, if you're looking for some number out of forty, ah, right? Okay, so right. Like a, yeah. Yeah. So, like a thirty-seven out of forty, which translates to some percentage that I will not do in my head, and frankly, I could have probably picked better numbers for, but this count of marks is not currently a percentage, right? Yeah. When it's written like that. This is very easy to align with marking schemes in maths and things when there is a correct answer. If you are in a situation where you do not have a clear correct answer, percentage scales suck. You just can't actually use them. Mm, what percentage out of 100 is this essay? It doesn't mean anything. Dean's looking skyward. What's up? 87.5%. What? 37 out of 40, 87.5%. All ah, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I'm not doing it in my head. Because if you double each of them to get... 80? To get... Uh, yeah, that's right, right, right. So it's 74 over 80, and then if you half it to 18.5, so, uh, and then add 18.5 to 70... No, wait, I fucked that up. 92.5. Didn't I? Oh, what did I say? 87.5. I just realised, because it's an 8, not a... Cut this. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't do arithmetic in my head. Oh, I got confused by the 8 in the in the number. They thought it was 80. It's hard when you can't write it down. Yes! 
<laughs> this is why I have slides. I like that Sorry, Dean and I are the dumb guys on this podcast, but I don't try to do stuff like that, whereas <laughs> he attempts to. Oh, I think you should try to do more. <laughs> it's, it's that or listen to the content. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't fool me. The general idea with the numerical scale, whatever it is, whether it's percentage or counted marks, is that you can assign a number of things to count to a given piece of assessment that represent some proportion of the total material that it's meant to assess. This is where we get to our marking rubrics. Yeah, kind of. Um, so marking rubrics are often on a numerical scale. Yep. Not always, but often. Some of them are more flexible than others. I have seen some genuine problems of converting a marking rubric to a percentage where in, if you had like one to five, with one being the lowest mark and five being the top, instead of taking zero, 20, 40, 60, 100 or something, yeah, yeah. they went 10, 30, 50, 70, 90, which meant that you could never get full marks for that assessment. Oh. Yeah, because if you got... Five out of five across the board, you got 90%. This upsets you spiritually. Oh, it does. It really fucking does. I didn't want know when I was going to introduce this concept, uh, but no, I think now is appropriate time. Academia is feudals and for nerds, right? Like, Ah, <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> There's no, like... Except instead of marching out into the field, I march into a lecture hall. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, But it is, like, yeah, a yeah. very established hierarchy that you have to, like, appeal yep. to various, like... It progresses one death at a time. Yeah, yeah, much absolutely. Like feudalism. <laughs> <laughs> All those people with the permanent positions... They either die or they retire, and that's how you hope to get a job. Yeah, absolutely. Because everybody knows that universities aren't expanding. And you never will. So like... young academics, Google f- and see what comes up in your <laughs> your search results there. I'm not responsible for anything you do with this information. Maybe put it on safe search, though, before you do that. For example, as a, like, counted marks thing, I tell students when I am marking their responses to something where I want them to do a hypothesis test that they will get marks for telling me what number they used to do the test, telling me what the decision was, and telling me the threshold of evidence that they used. So that's three marks, because there's three pieces of information I want to see there. Three marks? Conservatives hate universities because they're all Marxist. I was really hoping you were going for, like, a currency joke there. Yeah, they're always marking. That's why they're so Marxist. I mean, it's euros at this point, right? So, theoretically, we can reuse these percentages to represent <laughs> <laughs> how much of the material has been understood or done correctly. Theoretically, we can do that. In practice, that requires you being able to meaningfully quantify the material that is being assessed which means not only materially quantify all the particular things you are assessing, but also say how much they are worth relatively in the subject. For mass subjects, presumably that exists so that if you can show you're working, but like have got like one figure wrong, like one number wrong on the scale and come to the wrong conclusion, you can still get some marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so not everybody does that. So that is slightly separate to this. Yeah. So that is a question of what do you award marks to? Yeah. For example, when I am marking stuff that involves calculations, I award marks for the correct calculation, even if you stuff up the arithmetic, because frankly, arithmetic sucks. Yeah, yeah, sure. There are people who do not do that. I have some issues with this as a philosophy of teaching. But either one is possible and either one can be a counted marks system. It's just a question of what marks you award and where. Right. So the strengths of this one are broadly that it's easy to connect to things when there is a correct answer. So, for example, have you done this calculation correctly? There's a right or wrong answer to that. It has greater precision than ordinal. How meaningful that is will depend very much on how it's applied and to what. And it's easier to look at a sort of population dis- distribution if you have this across a lot of students. Is precision in this particular case actually obtainable, though? Ah, that's a very good question. So one of the problems with this is that correctly applying the measurement system is hard. What I mean by that is actually working out what is worth marks and how many marks it is worth is genuinely difficult. And 
while you can have consistent numerical scales in the sense that everybody gets the same marking guide, everybody gets the same marks for the same things that are in their work, I don't think that there's such a thing as an objective one. This is particularly for academic work. You can, of course, measure the percentage number of things that were done correctly, which is a numerical scale, right? Yeah. But when it comes to, like, a, a stats assignment or something, I will write a marking guide. This is for, like, first-year stuff. I write a marking guide that says how many marks are awarded for what. That is applied to all the students consistently. But what I apply marks to and how many marks I apply to it is subjective. It's me as the teacher going, what do I want to see my students doing? Yeah. What do I value in them learning from this? What do I need them to show me they can do? And that's what I will award more marks to. Whereas, like, if something is what I would call a discriminator question that is intended to pick out the best students who will be the ones that get it, I'm not going to award very many marks to that because I don't want to hugely penalize the students who are good but not outstanding. So it'd be like on a final exam, 2% of the final exam out of 100% might be on this particular question, which is conceptually difficult, requires a bit of abstract thinking, maybe a bit of like thinking about what they've learned in ways that other questions don't. If I wanted to be an asshole, frankly, in my marking, I could make all of the questions a lot harder along those lines. And I could award marks to reward the particularly good people by asking those difficult questions and awarding more marks to them. Right, so you can design a an exam so that a certain amount of the marks are harder to achieve than others. Absolutely, you can. Like a video game where the last of the five collectibles is much harder to find than the first four. Yes. Now imagine that two of the five are much harder to find. That's a different sort of system, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's very, very difficult to do because none of this is realistically very objective. Like, I can say I want those three pieces of information in a response to a hypothesis test, and I think that those are a reasonable three pieces of information to, uh, to ask for, but somebody else might decide that there's a fourth piece of information, or that they are only awarding one mark for correctly doing it overall. And it is hard to say which one of these is the best way to assess that, because they're just doing different things. It seems like what you just described is like this weird thing where like sorting out the good from the brilliant has its functions in very specific cases, but like generally is not like useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this is a genuine question about what is higher education specifically for. Yeah. Is higher education to provide a minimum standard of mastery to people so that they can go and get a job in their relevant field? Yeah. Or is university education to identify the very best students who will then go on to become academics themselves? It's both, in many respects, for better or worse. Sure. And this is why I don't judge people who say P's make degrees, or passes, for those who don't recognize the um, Who haven't been, like, slogan. grounded to the dust by yeah. <laughs> going to university. Yeah, that <laughs> couldn't be me. But basically, I don't begrudge those people. I don't begrudge people who see a university degree as a meal ticket because realistically they are typically working class people who are looking to improve their material conditions and they have been told that university is how you do that whether or not that's actually true is something we will deal with in another episode sure. but if they are there with the intention of passing so they can go and get a job and they expect to learn more on the job because realistically you do no degree will perfectly um prepare you for work for whatever job you do not even the academic ones i'd say most of the most degrees are absolutely useless for actually teaching you the work you will be performing yeah they're mostly useful i think for teaching you how to learn. Right. Which is teaching not you some fundamental principles. brain shapes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it depends on the degree you're doing. Like, there are t often technical skills which are important and relevant. So, like, in a chemistry degree, you want to learn how to do stuff in a lab. So that should be assessed. But it's also critical when you come out of that chemistry degree that you have lab skills to operate as a chemist. Yeah, yeah. Even if those lab skills will improve with practice and your theoretical understanding will also improve with practice. I'm not going to get too into the into this part of, you know, what is university actually for, etc. But a great deal of degrees are often about just teaching somebody certain social conventions. Like, there's a lot of cynics who say that university is just sort of a finishing school for 
a particular argument. A finishing school for the middle class. I mean, right, I, yeah, and I believe I've made that argument not, before on this podcast. I don't so think like you're a... wrong. <laughs> genuinely, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think it's the only thing that universities do, but I think that there is a genuine social function where they are there for middle class people to go and tick a box that says, yes, I qualify for a middle class job. Well, it's not, it's not just that they also teach you certain ways of... of co- yeah, they teach you a culture. Of, so, and certain degrees are more than more that than the other mm. than others. Communication skills are a genuinely useful thing to come out of an arts degree. Yeah. I don't think, oh, it's just communication. I don't think that's dismissing it. I think that they are incredibly useful, not least of which because when I came to do a maths degree, having come out of arts, the most useful skill was knowing how to do research and write a fucking essay because I knew how to structure an argument and communicate it clearly, which is an awful lot more of what maths and stats is than the calculations that I did in high school maths, for example. I would prefer our um, systems of, like, learning after high school were completely different to the way that they are. I don't love universities as an institution, but at the same time... I don't, not least because I fucking work there. Yeah, yeah, of course. (laughs) But at the same time, I will say that I think there is a value to even, like, like, I did one of the middle-class bullshit degrees where useful to your life. I do think there is a value to having people in this society that can not only care about media and fucking literature and shit like that, but can convey why everyone else should care. Like, I think that's, yes. like, kind of important. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think... Oh, absolutely. So, I think that a classics degree is not useful for the upper class, or should not be useful for the kind of upper class signifier that it represents, right? But an English literature degree is useful for your ability to say, well, no, this is our culture. This is how it reflects who we are as Anglo subjects, yeah. if you will. This is how it reflects our understanding of ourselves, That's useful and that's important, and I think that is one of the things that the right denigrates because they don't like that mirror being turned on. Sure, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, and even even though they paradoxically wank off to the idea of European culture and its works of art, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's reason they go for marble statues and not like great works of literature, like Marx. Yeah, like no, precisely right. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say he's necessarily a great writer, but you know, you kidding? Manifesto's a fucking banger. Manifesto's a banger. Capital's a slog. Okay. Capital is like a slog, but at the same time, like, it's, it's meant to be. It's, it's like a economics test. Like a political economy. Look, he, he is a man who could have benefited from some algebra, but I understand why he didn't use sure, algebra. Sure, sure, sure. But- Tess dislikes Star Wars. She dislikes the work of Marx. Hmm, curious. <laughs> I would say that uh, Marx's main weakness is the, the Hegel influence in terms of it. he had to make it into a theological thing, and it doesn't quite work that way. This is a fine liberal education you can get at universities in Australia, yes. I barely passed through. This is my own research that I've done since, but... <laughs> What I would say is that you should care about Nightwood by Juna Barnes, which is one of the best modernist novels ever written, and no one's ever read it, and it fucking I was going to say, rocks. I haven't. Like, it is so good. It would be good if you could replicate caring about that shit in a broader mm. context than universities. Like, Yeah, well, one of the things that I rile against in the university structure is that because it's seen and it's used as a meal ticket people don't get to just go along because they think it's interesting. Yeah. As somebody who has, due to, you know, the accident of their birth, been able to basically fuck around at university because they found things interesting, everybody should be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And it shouldn't leave you with a lifetime of debt because you just think something would be fun to try. But the structure we have for universities, because they operate as a business, means that that doesn't exist for anybody but some rich cunt like me, I guess. <laughs> Deanie like drinky, but Deanie drinky too much. What's the weakness <laughs> of the numerical scale? I want to go to bed. <laughs> so precision is not often meaningful. Oh, uh, what I was going to be- ask about sorting out the the good from the meaningful is like, is there a good reason for that? The, in practice at a university... This is part of how you identify your prospective PhD students and future researchers. Right. It's also potentially how you identify the people you think could teach the subject in the future. Right. Because 
you really want those very, very good students who get it to be the ones teaching it. Yeah. You don't necessarily want the people who get it without trying to teach it because then they don't necessarily understand where things can be hard to to comprehend. Yeah. And can frankly be assholes to students sometimes. So somebody who has struggled but worked hard enough to understand and then gets good marks, ideal teacher material, frankly. So when I say precision can be meaningless, is there really a difference between an 84 and an 85? Is there really a difference between a 49 and a 50? Or hell, an 80 and an 85? These scale of precision that you can find in a percentile measurement, which is what this is. I mean, in the counting marks, is there really a difference between 37 and 38 in what I've written here, for example? That is very difficult to justify. Yeah. It is particularly difficult to justify if, because the way assessment is structured at university, you have to apply a numerical scale to something like an essay. Then you're just fucked, yeah. frankly. Or a piece of creative writing. Yes. Oh my god. Are exams the best way to find this, or is coursework, I guess? like I am not convinced that any of the assessments we use are a particularly good way to identify this stuff. Sure. Because I think that the time pressure in universities, and the fact that in undergrad you can't get feedback and make revisions on your work yeah. for assignments or essays, almost universally, means they are bad instruments of assessment. Because there are very, very few real-world situations where you, in comparison to an exam, can't look up supporting material. Yeah. Or in comparison to, like, an assignment or an exam, can't make revisions to something that gets submitted. I mean, they, they sometimes happen, like, particularly in law or something, where you're submitting a brief or a report or whatever. But they are rare, and often you will get opportunities. If you fuck up something, you can go, oh, sorry, I fucked that up, here's the new version. Yeah. So in that respect, I think that they are deeply unrealistic and deeply punishing of people who make mistakes that are easily remedied. Yeah. Or have misconceptions that don't get identified outside of assessment. This is also why a lot of assessment is very, very badly structured, because let's say you've got three parts of your subject, so three different kind of sections of the material, you might have an assignment for each one. If something is only assessed in one piece of assessment, then you don't have an option to learn from it. Yeah. This is particularly the case if you only have like a final exam for a subject, and that's the only time you get feedback on anything you've done, which is still the case in some universities in the UK. These systems of assessment where there is no opportunity to learn from feedback are just fucked and bad. There is no situation where I think that is particularly justifiable. Unfortunately, they're also everywhere because we as university teachers are not properly trained or paid to prepare assessment to, to repeatedly assess something and give opportunity for feedback. Furthermore, if you do have a situation where, let's say, something is assessed in the first assignment and the final exam, that first assignment hopefully doesn't count for very much of your assessment, because if you fuck it up in the first assessment and you correct that on the final exam, that initial fuck up still counts towards your final mark. Yeah. Right, even though that's a piece of... Oh, even knowledge. though you've learned. Right. So this is not necessarily something in the numerical scale, this is just broader about assessment things, right? You asked about exams and assignments. Broadly, assessment is not a good representation of somebody's knowledge because it doesn't really account for their ability to correct mistakes. Yes. I have particular issues with exams, not least of which because they give me panic attacks, <laughs> but also because the inability to look something up or ask for clarification is unrealistic in the extreme. But it's basically done because the way that we structure education means we cannot trust students to be honest in their assessment. Yeah. And I blame the way we structure education for that, not necessarily the students themselves. I think that there are some students who cheat because they don't really see they have any other choice because they are desperate. I think that there are other students who just basically cheat because they see that the system is flawed and that they can. They're not wrong, I just think they're assholes. Uh, because cheating on assessments means that this stuff is necessary and this stuff sucks. Yep. Yeah, that's my rant about assessments. Look, honestly, everyone <laughs> should cheat. You have that on a later notes page? If, uh, it's very unlikely, but if you are a uh, university student right now, no, fucking cheat. If you can get away with it, like, I don't want you to get caught, but come on, like, fucking do it. Like. <laughs> so the effort that people put towards cheating almost universally would be better spent actually just fucking learning the material. Yeah, some of the people you hear about cheating where it's... Okay, here's a little bit of insight into how math assessment works. 
competent cheating in maths is basically impossible to detect in undergrad because there is a right answer and there's usually only a couple of ways to getting to it. Yeah. Incompetent cheating is so fucking obvious. Don't get me wrong. You, you've got to, like, do this shit properly. You can't, like... <laughs> and frankly, the competent cheaters are smart enough to learn the material most of the time. Yeah, yeah, of course. The incompetent cheaters would be better spent trying to learn the material at all. Well, one other thing I will say is that if the qualification you are getting and if the assessment you are doing relates to things that will directly impact the well-being of another person, don't cheat. Often it's d more difficult to do so in those, particularly when it's, like, technical competency, but somebody cheating on medical exams is more likely to be a problem well i mean they may have other problems elsewhere when it comes to that process but like <clears throat> cheating on exams in qualifications that lead to you being in healthcare can be a bit of an issue because if you do not have those skills <laughs> somebody else's life might be on the line right so, and i get my chest hair waxed by the diode <laughs> <laughs> exactly pay attention another possible weakness with the numerical scale is that if you transform a percentage to an ordinal scale, so for example, when you come to this high distinction, distinction, credit, blah, 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 usually the cutoffs are like 85 plus for high distinction, 75 to 84. This is why I'm so salty about the 84s I got for distinction. <laughs> 65 to 75, 74, sorry. Uh, 50 to 64 and less than 50, right? So converting those numerical scales to the ordinal scale, those thresholds should be blurrier than they actually are, because realistically the ordinal scale doesn't work like that, and the thresholds may or may not account for the actual performance of students in a particular subject. One of the interesting things about the Australian system is that high distinction is 15%, like the top 15% of the marks qualify for a high distinction, but about 5% of the students actually get high distinction for a given subject. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that this, like, numerical scale translating to the ordinal scale is not all that straightforward, because the numbers are not actually a direct numerical representation of understanding or knowledge, nor is the ordinal scale really a great understanding of the proportion or the sort of, I guess, order of knowledge that people have. It's all fucked, pretty much. It's all fucked. All of it is vibes. So unfortunately, a lot of it does matter, though. As much as I hate engineering students, would it be more like, <laughs> would it be more accurate there than it would be in, say, I don't know, arts or... Engineering is often, a, a lot of engineering stuff behaves like maths because it is maths in that there is a right answer to the problem. Yeah. So in those cases, I think it is more relevant to use like a marks based scale. Right. This is not always true, uh, particularly if you have like report writing or information presentation stuff, which does matter if you're an engineer. Often you wind up writing an awful lot of reports. Yeah. But there, a lot of the sort of vibes, well, um, not really vibes based stuff, but the less numerical stuff is about communication skill. Yeah. And that is very, very difficult to assign marks to. Right. Because really what you're doing is, okay, this person is better at communicating whatever the fuck that means compared to this other person. I can't necessarily explain what that means because it's very hard. And certainly we are not taught how to assess it properly. Yeah. But I have, I have an idea that one person is better at this than another. I then have to translate that to marks and that's difficult. Apologies to the both of you. I need to go to the toilet. I shouldn't have drunk those beers and uh, I'm rapidly falling asleep. So okay. I'll let you two wrap this one up. All right. I, I have relatively little left to say just because we've actually covered most of this. Statistically insignificant. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing I'm going to say is that using numbers encourages people to measure things, which is bad. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. We're leading people down a bad path. It's a no, numbers are bad. You heard it here first, right? <laughs> so what I mean by that is people see a number and think that whatever it's applied to should behave like numbers. For example, is the difference between a mark of 45 and 55, which is 10, really the same as the difference between 80 and 90? Certainly, when we look at this scale of the, like, awarded marks 
in Australia, these are not all the same distance. So your pass is 15 or 14. Well, not it is 15 because it includes 50, 50. Your credit is 10 wide. Your distinction is 10 wide. Your high distinction is 15 wide. Your fail is 50 wide. Yeah. These are not the same things. And I don't think it's necessarily fair to argue that a pass and a credit are, or, or a credit and a distinction are the same distance apart as any other sort of thing. Yeah. This is why I think that, on the whole, an ordinal scale is more realistic to academic work than a percentage scale. We just don't always necessarily get the opportunity to actually use them as teaching staff. Like, don't you come back to the fact of, like, the ordinal scale removed from the percentage scale ends up at a place where like group of people who are so the the marks inflation stuff not even the marks inflation stuff kind of the opposite like you have a group of people who can kind of like decide who's good and who's bad a marking is always a group of people deciding who's good and who's bad as a hierarchy is all i'm it, it like provides a hierarchy i guess like <laughs> well yes any ordered or percentage based thing i mean even even pass fail right sure that fundamentally provides a hierarchy of performance it's just that the performance is binary you either are good enough to pass or you are not good enough and then you fail i think the question if you are somebody designing this is what statistical tool is fit to purpose for what you are trying to do yeah and i think that very very rarely is something like a percentage scale, like a numerical percentage scale, actually useful and meaningful? Yeah. I think that ordinal scales are generally better for academic work. Yeah. If you're using a numerical scale, it's probably worth only applying it to something like, what proportion of the time do you do this thing correctly? Sure, yeah. Because yeah. I think that is a fair implementation of it, right? Yeah. I think that numerical counting marks is easier to apply when you have... A right answer yeah so i think that you can make an argument that if you have a correct answer to something you can say yep that's correct give it a tick and however many things are correct get that number of ticks but that is far more variable than people treat it as yeah by hierarchy i wasn't using even using that as a necessarily negative term if it's more vibe space than a percentage point you might, like, favour the student that you like compared to, like... Yes. So so this is uh, about consistency of marking. Yeah. So um, what I'm talking about is kind of, I guess, validity. How appropriate is your marking scale? Wh whatever tool you're using, how appropriate is it to what you're trying to do? You're talking about consistency, which is, am I applying the same tool to all of my students? Yeah, right. That makes sense. The ideal, right, is that something is both valid and consistent. Yeah. In practice, the best you can do is typically consistent and some argument towards reasonable yeah. instead of necessarily valid. Consistency is, again, hard because it gets harder in some areas than others. It's very, it's relatively straightforward, I should say, not very, relatively straightforward if there's a correct answer because then it's kind of, it's right or it's not. Yeah. Or this thing is present or it's not. And this is why it's much easier to write marking guides for something like math than it is for anything else, and particularly undergraduate math. Sure. If you have something like an essay, there's a lot of vibes that go into that. There's yeah. a lot of questions around who wrote the essay and, and does that affect how you're reading it. And I think that some of that you can get around with, like, blind marking. Yeah. In an ideal world, the person marking the assignment doesn't necessarily know who wrote it yeah sometimes that may aid with consistency but it does not necessarily help students on the whole sure because if like it's one thing to have a consistent marking scheme it's another to have for example a marking scheme that allows somebody to take into account material circumstances of the student yeah, yeah, yeah. now theoretically the marking scale is not where you do that theoretically how you do that is this student has applied for special consideration or the formal processes. Seems useless. Well, it's, I mean, it's not useless, but there's a barrier to entry. Yeah, for sure. So for the people for whom it works, it's fine. It's a good system, generally speaking. It's a good system so long as the university takes it seriously. And I have been at institutions where it's not, and I am leaving those institutions. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a separate issue. If you have the leeway 
to give somebody a bit of an easier time on an assignment because you know that they've just had a death in the family or they have been sick. Should you not do that? Yeah. If you understand what they're... And this is where what is fit for purpose in a marking scale kind of comes up against what do you intend that assessment to actually do for this person in this degree program. Yeah. Because you may quite reasonably and justifiably believe that your student is competent. Yeah. That your student can do the thing, but on the day of the exam, they had a panic attack in the middle of it. Sure. That leeway is very, very difficult to justify on a consistency basis when it comes to marking assessment. But that is where the statistical instrument of the marking scheme as a statistical instrument, is blind to the material conditions of the students. And you, as a, as a teacher, have a kind of responsibility of pastoral care to your students to... I don't, bend the rules is the wrong thing to say, but shall we say, like, make allowances when things are tough. And addressing this to our dear listeners, and thank you for listening, <laughs> it seems like it can sometimes go the opposite direction where people get discriminated against oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure but like obviously people get discriminated against in all parts of life but it seems very like specific that the people who succeed in that kind of generosity like people from working class backgrounds or people of color or yeah. like whatever group you want to talk about like it seems like some people get more leeway than others. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah, That yeah, is right. a problem. And this is why, well, this is the argument against leeway, right? This is the, the argument for the formal system at the university where if you have this kind of an issue, you go and you apply for special consideration. But I think that's fucked too because- like, Yes, absolutely. The, the, these are all imperfect systems. Yes. Yeah. And because education is fundamentally a social human process yeah there is no perfect solution to these yeah you know you do the best you can for your students sure you try to apply the leeway that you give equitably yeah across your student body but there are very very few safeguards realistically yeah. to a student having somebody who just does not like them for bad reasons give them worse marks yes and arguably a good marking system a good instrument for assessment should protect against that and th i mean this is where the statistical instrument meets the material conditions of the student is where the politics of that statistical instrument happen. Yeah. That's one of the reasons that I care so much about this sort of thing is because I would very much like to be able to structure my assessments in a manner that are able to best represent my students' ability, not punish them for small mistakes. Yeah. There are some marking systems where that is easier than others. So like the counted marks percentage thing, that is arguably harder to apply that to than your grade scale. Because while I can say, okay, you had an arithmetic error here, so you get some marks, but not all the marks. Does that actually really represent their competence? I don't think so, necessarily, particularly no, when it's an exam. This stuff is hard, and it's very, very difficult to do in an education setting to actually treat this seriously, yeah. because you have some people who crawl up their own assholes in pursuit of the perfect measurement tool, which is not helpful Absolutely. because then <laughs> you don't get anything fucking done. Yeah. There are also people who are entirely too laissez-faire about it. Yeah. Beyond that, as a, at a structural level, we are not given the materials we need to do it properly. Yeah. If you are lucky, you get paid to write the assessments for the subject that you're doing. This does not always happen because academia is rife with uh, unpaid labor. Sure. That doesn't mean you have been trained to do it properly. That does not mean there is any kind of a, a system to give you support and review of what you are doing. Yeah. And certainly you would not be paid for that time if it existed. Yeah. If students are lucky, they have a robust complaint system. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's just, well, quite realistically, that's the sort of standard we operate at at the university sector. Yeah. If we were given proper support to teach subjects, it would be a radically different situation. Yeah. We would still not have perfect instruments because I don't think they are possible. I don't think they could exist. But we could do, I think, better than we are. Okay. I think that's an episode because, oh my god, it's nearly two hours long. Yeah, yeah. Dear listener, as mentioned at the head of the show, we have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash statistically significant. 
insignificant. It's in the notes below. You can find it, I'm sure. Uh, help Bart pay his rent. And if you can't do and- that, please follow me on Twitter on at Snitching <laughs> Yeah, give him the clout yeah, he yeah. desperately <laughs> desires. I, I hear that exposure is something you can eat if you're really lucky. It's not, <laughs> but I like fucking posting on Twitter, so who cares? Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Again, I'm so sorry. I think they have a cream for that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll see you later. See ya.